Splendid. Okay, well, look, I was at Copenhagen for my sins. Um, I didn't have a day off in December because I spent all the weekends before that reporting on the great climate gate affair. So December was pretty heavy duty, and uh, like most people there at Copenhagen, I came out in a state of weird shell shock, not just because of exhaustion, because the hours were ridiculous, and they were ridiculous, but also a real sense of disorientation, because from the moment of getting there, I was asking the Danes and anyone else who I could ask, what is going on? How are you going to get these leaders and their leaders' meetings to mesh with the formal UN process with its dots and commas and due process and what is going to happen when the leaders come in and who's going to arrange their meetings and who will be in the meetings and what will happen to the leaders from South America who nobody wants to talk to because when Gordon Brown said world leaders should join me in Copenhagen he didn't have in mind uh, Mr. Mr. Gaddafi for instance I mean he, that wasn't what he was planning so what do you do with Gaddafi when he turns up in Copenhagen? Well, you leave him in his hotel room. And he's not very happy. So, you know, Copenhagen was a really disorienting process, and they hadn't figured out from the start how they would make these two processes mesh, and they still haven't figured out now. And that's why you're hearing really quite strong noises coming out from the Americans saying to, to, to the effect, the UN process is dead. And the Brits are saying, no, the UN process isn't dead, because if you kill the UN process, there are still so many countries who won't come on board that you won't have a proper global deal. So that's the process that's going to unf uh, unfold throughout this year. I I I've never been quite so uncertain about the landscape going forward uh, since Copenhagen, but hopefully we'll be able to explore some of these issues now. Now, where should we start? Um, let's start with John, because John Sovan from Greenpeace. John, I know you weren't there personally. Your people were there. Some of them were locked up over Christmas, I think. Could you just give us just a, a two-minute of ass assessment of what, what you think the landscape is for business post-Copenhagen? Just keep it to two minutes. If you don't, I'll, I'll stop you. <laughs> OK, well, it's difficult to do it in two, uh, two minutes. But I mean, to a certain extent, the Americans are right. You know, the UN process is dead. The idea that you could get 200 countries uh, to come together in a meeting and by consensus agree that they're going to radically change the global capitalist system uh, is a nonsense. And ultimately, that's what uh, people are being asked to do. And I think that, you know, we were asking politicians to be very altruistic, which, of course, is a nonsense as well, because we know they're not. That ultimately, they were going to look after their own narrow uh, domestic interests, their national sovereignty, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think, in a way, we have to kind of completely rethink the way that we go about uh, operating in this kind of new climate that we find ourselves in. And I think the UN still has a role to play, obviously, in finance, climate, uh, adaption, and mitigation, uh, issues to do with forests, and so on. But I think when it comes to the kind of big Uber deal, it, it isn't going to happen um, through that process. And I, I remember reading something recently, I think it was in the New York Times, and, ju and, and just developing on that theme just for, for 60 seconds. You know, if you look at what the United States did with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, they, they spent tens of trillions of dollars on mutually assured destruction in a massive, in the United States case, massive public-private partnership with some of the world's now biggest corporations like Lockheed Martin, GE, and so on. And in a way, what you now need is the equivalent of that between the United States and China. But instead of having a Cold War, you need um, a low-carbon economy race uh, rather than an, an arms race. And that is actually where we need to get to. We've got to solve this problem in the United States and China. Okay, well, and let I, me just interrupt you there briefly to, to yeah. ask, do you think post-Copenhagen we are any closer to getting that low-carbon race that you want? Well, I think, in, in, interestingly, maybe. I mean, if you look at what China has done, for example, if you look at some, some things, I think I'm right, but I don't know the exact facts, like the solar PV market. I think China a few years ago had 2% of that market. I think they've now got 47% of it. I mean, if China decides to do something, it can do it very rapidly in a very short space of time. And my, my main worry is actually for the EU, because I think the EU, the UK being part of that, actually did have a leading role in developing a low-carbon economy, had some very good regulations, and domestically also. 
But I, what worries me is that the business opportunities are going to be taken out of our hands and we're going to lose this race, actually, if we don't regain the leadership. And, and I think that there's the potential there for the EU to do it. And actually, as a bloc, to a certain extent, I know it's a complex bloc, but politically and economically, it has a lot of potential to do it. Uh, but I think that that's where the debate is going to be. Where does the EU actually want to position itself? Because the EU lost out in Copenhagen. It was brushed aside. So was progressive businesses. Very large businesses were brushed aside. So were NGOs brushed aside. And so I think we've got to kind of think, well, where do we actually want to position ourselves now in this, in this new world order uh, that's now being developed? Okay, thanks very much. I, I should point out that actually China's role in PV has been absolutely immense because as the market has collapsed, they have moved in to underpin it with very big domestic incentives. So they are responsible for the continuing strength of PV manufacture globally. And as a result of that, we're seeing PV prices plummeting. I did a piece on online, which you, you can find on our online site, suggesting that um, PV will, will reach grid parity in half of Europe by 2020. I mean, that's extraordinary. That's far faster than most people suggested. Anyway, Miles Templeman from the, the IOD, can you give us, pick up from where, where John left off, do you think Copenhagen has left us any closer to a low carbon economy, either globally or, or in the UK? Uh, very little. I think, as Michael said earlier, business has always been pretty skeptical about the ability of international agreement. And I guess Copenhagen confirmed that. And I think what it did, from our point of view, was absolutely endorse, and I think Carbon Trust is pretty right on this, we've got to focus on competitively priced, available, low-carbon energy, and all three have got to be in balance. We can't be in a position where the UK, in the hope of some international agreement, gets out of line. If we competitively disadvantage our business in the UK because we're getting ahead of the game, we will lose economically. And I don't think that's the right answer, and it doesn't solve any of the questions anyway. So I think it endorses very much the striving for greater energy efficiency, which I know is where the main emphasis is. And I know Tom talked about that somewhat sort of sadly, that that is the focus, but I think that's the reality, not just because of the recession, but also because of the international competition. And therefore, more business activity with the help of Carbon Trust and others could be done on improving energy efficiency. And therefore, regardless of the, econ of the international position, we will gain. And obviously, alongside that, which again, I applaud your efforts, and I think it could be bigger and stronger, whether it's with this government or the next, is about greater emphasis on exploiting the business potential of the new technologies. So I think that drive for efficiency and that drive for exploitation, and that was there before and was not dramatically changed by Copenhagen. So um, from what you're saying, I'm taking that you definitely wouldn't want the UK to go ahead with higher targets without the EU. What if the EU were to go to 30%, even if, say, let's suppose, let's suppose that Obama loses this election for the Kennedy seat, and he loses his blocking majority in the Senate, and we assume that US legislation gets held up for the entire year, maybe until next year. Would you say that the EU then shouldn't shouldn't accept its 30% target because the Americans hadn't delivered? Would you go that far on competitiveness? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just with the Americans because our main competition is not just with Europe and not just with the US, it's obviously with China. And if we're moving out of line with them in terms of the actual cost to UK or PLC of our energy because we're trying to reach targets that they're not even trying to reach, we will disadvantage ourselves. We won't save overall the carbon emissions. We will simply lose the jobs. Okay, thank you. David uh, Croft from Cadbury. Actually, before I come to you, I can't let, the, I can't let this moment pass, can I? Because <laughs> everybody... Okay, go. <laughs> I'm going to go anyway with it, Roger. Sorry. Oh, okay, on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is this news? Um, Not I don't Copenhagen, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Listen, I mean, I, I think I would sum, sum today's news up as, as proverbially we live in interesting times. Um, <laughs> I, Cadbury over the last three years has delivered some fantastic performance, some great growth figures, and I guess you know, the new news of today is really you know, going to focus people's attention about how we uh, will take that performance, how we take that growth into potential new company structures uh, based on what our board has recommended today. So, um, as I say, interesting times, but 
you know, frankly, today is more about you know, the challenges we face tackling climate change and issues like that, which are way bigger than two no, companies talking to each it, other. It, it, indeed it is, but I think people wouldn't have forgiven me if I hadn't, if <laughs> no, I, no, no, if I okay. hadn't asked you. I am a journalist, after all. <laughs> there are downsides to getting journalists to do these things. Um, now, let's, let's pick up here where we just left off. Uh, do you think, you, you also of the mind that the EU should not go to the 30% target, which would mean 42% in the UK based on 1990 levels and on our burden sharing, should we refuse to go that far uh, unless the United States gets a meaningful bill through? What, what's your view? I think, you know, at a policy level, uh, I think the EU has to, has to take a position and then from a business point of view, at least we know where we stand. I'm very much in line with Miles that, you know, this is a question about um, you know, the, the competitive position that British business will be in. And British business is, is taking you know, great strides, as we've heard from the Carbon Trust already, in terms of developing um, lower carbon approaches, reduced energy, uh, reduced energy uh, usage, uh, and, and just being improved efficiency. I mean, Cadbury, for example, has already uh, publicly said we, we are committed to hitting a 50% absolute reduction by 2020. And therefore, an EU target is you know, slightly relevant to us. But I actually think we have to think about the broad picture and how that sort of target from the EU would impact upon, upon business generally, which okay, may let, not let, be that let great. Let me just stop, stop you there. You've made a decision to take a leadership position on this issue. Mm -hmm. Why are you saying that the EU shouldn't take a leadership position on this issue? Well, I think you know, what, I, what we would look for would be consistency from what the EU is saying to give us the policy framework that actually allows business to invest effectively for the future. It's that consistent approach. Now, now, I think the EU has to take into account you know, big, a bigger picture than just Cadbury alone. But from our position, you know, the, the business case was very strong. The questions around sustainability, whether it's environment uh, or, or a wide range of things, whether it's about carbon fuels, whether it's about packaging or water, are, are fundamental to underpinning business growth. And I don't think that we can set up a business um, to support a low carbon um, policy framework that inevitably will come in the future without um, you know, businesses like Cadbury taking steps forward and, and making the sort of step changes in operation practice uh, and in investment at times that, that shape us for that sort of future. That was you know, the business logic that we applied to it. Now, you know, the EU operates in a, in, in, a, in a broader policy framework than Cadbury does, but fundamentally for business, um, you know, I think it's about efficiencies and it's about driving the right sort of business uh, model that will support effective and competitive business for the future. You know, and quite simply, if I look at our energy uh, bill of 100 million pounds a year, a year, if I can't put 10% savings onto that very quickly, then I'm not doing my job as a business person. Um, so you know, I think the arguments for, for businesses and the arguments for the, for the EU are somewhat different. But you know, business has a role to play. Uh, and, and some of that is enlightened self-interest. Some of it is about what we would talk, I suppose, about uh, principal capitalism and setting an agenda that demonstrates practically how things can develop for the future. And if that then influences the policy framework for the future, then, then so be it. But business has a role to, to support value for its shareholders and value for its, uh, for its employees. And, and, and that's the approach that we've really stri striven to take. Hmm. OK, look, I won't ask you this question because I know you won't answer it. But I would make the point that there will be some people in this room who would have seen the, uh, the historic performance of a Quaker-based company like Cadbury's with all those Quaker values showing through in many sectors of the business performance being taken over um, by an American conglomerate uh, whose record in the field is perhaps, shall we say, not quite so strong. But I won't ask you that question because <laughs> it's probably not very fair on you. <laughs> uh, let me come to you, Damien Rees, from the, the Telegraph group. Where do you see things sitting post Copenhagen? How much pressure is there on businesses? Has the pressure eased off now? Do businesses now have to take a, a leadership role? Should they? Give, give me your view on that. Um, I've got a sneaking suspicion that would actually achieve a low carbon economy rather more quickly if we didn't, if we weren't given these constant targets by government uh, and NGOs. Uh, if business was allowed to get on with it, uh, we'd probably get there rather more quickly. Uh, business should take a leadership role. You're absolutely right. Business is taking a leadership role. Uh, I think what it could do with, however, is some clearer signals from government instead of saying we should reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. 
which Lord Turner's uh, Climate Change Committee uh, talked about, and which is enshrined in an Act of Parliament, which I don't think anyone here probably voted for, uh, instead of saying completely meaningless statements like that, if they want to change behaviour, they should do it through things like the fiscal system, the tax system. Give people the opportunity, give people the incentive to change things. Let resources be allocated through business and through consumption decisions. And I think, personally, you would see a much more rapid change in the UK, in Western Europe, uh, in the developing um, markets as well, because they will follow, because consumer pressure in developing markets, even in China, is just as strong as it is in the West. So I'm getting increasingly frustrated with politicians and governments and NGOs, etc., who think they know what they're talking about. They think they're adopting a leadership position, but in fact, all they're doing is putting the brakes on progress. OK, let me just challenge you on a couple of thoughts there. One is that businesses will do the right thing. Just in terms of energy efficiency, we know historically that businesses don't do the sensible thing from their own point of view because yes. it's a very, very low priority in terms of their, their general performance unless they happen to be a high energy business. And in terms of the 2050 standard setting, that is exactly what the CBI have been asking for. Show us where we've got to aim and we can put our long-term investment framework in place. So let me challenge you on those two. I think the energy efficiency point is a good one, Roger. I think you're absolutely right. I think companies should do more to invest, to save money. I mean, it's a pretty obvious thing to do. Uh, and in doing so, I think shareholders and the owners of businesses, I mean, many of you here may own your own businesses, but a lot of you here will represent public companies or companies with shareholders. And I think shareholders themselves need to engage more with this issue. I don't think the city fund managers, the world of finance really fully understands what's going on here. And if they forced management to be more efficient and required management to be more efficient, then again, you'd see a lot more progress a lot more quickly. Um, I think when it comes to targets, I think a much more useful and reliable uh, 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 form uh, or reliable action that the government should take rather than set targets is to be a little clearer perhaps on regulation and, and you know, get the stick out a bit more so that members of the CBI uh, um, understand exactly what's going to happen if they don't act. And I think I would welcome tougher regulation if you know, it's, it underpinned, it put a floor under the problem, and yeah. companies would then actually have far more make, clarity. Make a level playing field. Yeah. Miles Templeman, the IOD has not traditionally been in favour of legislation. Just very briefly a comment on that before we move to these guys this side. Yeah, no, I agree with Damon's overall comment about letting business get on with it. I don't agree, if the CBI did say it, with overall targets. I think they're meaningless, and I think it's much more interesting to stimulate by appropriate regulation, not disproportionate, by appropriate incentives. Uh, and as was said about Cadbury, companies will tend to then set their own targets and may well exceed what they were asked to achieve by the government. But setting an overall target in this, as in many other areas, is meaningless and can even be counterproductive. OK, thank you. I don't want to introduce the, the, the CBI. They've been just making the point they want a general clarity on these issues. Yeah. Richard Reid from Innocent, let, let me come to you. You're from a very different sort of, of, of company. Uh, you've made money out of taking a principal stand on these issues. What messages do you take out of Copenhagen and out of the, the global and domestic situation that we're in? I have to say, actually, over the last few years, we've lost money out of taking a, 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 a position. But um, what do I think about uh, Copenhagen? I think that uh, it's not surprising the way it's turned out, but... It's an un unimaginably complex task, and I support what it was there to do, and I'm a big believer that a lack of ambition is self-fulfilling, and I think actually what the world now we needs now is people that are engaged with the positive uh, things that we can do that do make a difference. Um, I think business can help with that. I think business has a constant dialogue with its consumers, and if there was some way that business could unite behind what would be the core messages about what we could play our part in communicating, such as small things like laggy loft, eat more vegetables, use your car less, I think business can play a small role there. Is um, that business's role to do that? 
I think there is absolutely every altruistic argument to make why business can play in that. I also think there's very hardcore capitalist reasons. Um, consumers care about it. Employees care about it. And I think that is such a way for consumer power to really translate into business action. It's us as consumers then engaging with our employers about the, the, the practices we um, commission as businesses. This is a really sort of easy thing to say, and it sounds like a bit of a soundbite. It also is true. The whole industrialization of the world did start from British businesses. So you could argue from a moral perspective, then we should be prepared to take a lead. But I just start from the position of capitalism. There's sunlit uplands. There is so much money to be made from doing the right thing and being the guys. I have to say, I believe in setting targets, because for me, running a business, it's the setting of targets that stretches the imagination and stretches targets. the performance. Achievable target. I think a target should be at least 50% unachievable, because that's how you get the stretch. <laughs> No, I, I do believe in that. And, um, You're setting it, not the government, that's what I was saying. Yeah. yeah, but I think the government can set it on behalf of the country, and the business can set it on behalf of the businesses. You I don't agree. believe in Chinese-style targets, where they set targets they are inevitably going to fulfil and then claim they've fulfilled their targets. That's what you mean, I think. Uh, I would just rather have a bold target and fall a bit short than to not start it from a sort of bold ambition in the first place. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm aware that we're running over time, and I'm aware that some, at least one member of the panel has to go sharp. So I want to bring in members of the audience, but before I do, there's one other key thing that I think uh, I ought to, to bring up now, which is what is the political landscape going to be for this issue over the coming year? We can see the three major parties taking the same agenda uh, into the uh, election, ostensibly, but there's just been a poll on Conservative Home um, the website asking about MPs or prospective MPs' priorities, and climate change is at the bottom of the list of priorities. And Tim Montgomery from Conservative Home was quoted as saying something like, Cameron is lost. The question is, how does he get out? So there will be at least two members, two climate skeptic members of the new cabinet. We see now that, I mean, you, you'll have noticed the Daily Express now has gone completely climate skeptic. Mail on Sunday is going climate skeptic. Sunday Telegraph is a long-term climate skeptic newspaper. Daily Mail is going kind of climate skeptic. If, if uh, the po politics and, uh, and media are moving that way, what realistically do we expect at the end of the year in terms of policy outcomes, not in terms of election promises? So actually, look, so Tom, let me just start with you on this. And then I'm going to go to Miles and Damien, and then we'll open to the audience for other questions. But let's quickly run through this one. In fact, your budget. How confident are you about your budget for the future? We're working on a steady state budget uh, until we know otherwise. But at the moment, yeah, frankly, we are more no, concerned about... the quangos, no, you know, we're, no, we're, we're more concerned about the outcomes that we can deliver. Uh, we believe we can deliver very significant material outcomes in all kinds of ways. And we will tailor, essentially, our focus to meeting our customers' needs. That's the starting point. Uh, and, and what, we'll about, what about the politics? How do you see the politics How unraveling? do I see, see the politics? I mean, uh, I think there has been a bit of a knockback. Um, you know, a combination of Copenhagen not being, or not, not achieving the expectations that were maybe unrealistically set for it. Um, dare I say, a, a, a spell of bad weather and people not understanding the difference between climate and weather, which is a big issue. I think fundamentally, I saw, saw that uh, poll, um, those prospective Tory candidates are actually out of line with certainly our research into uh, consumer uh, attitudes in the UK, which suggests that people have very much understood and accepted the underlying uh, threat of climate change and the causes of it. Um, if anything, they are now, though, sitting back and saying, now what do we do about it? How can we make a difference going forward? And I think a lot more transparency around that will help engage consumers. Once you've engaged consumers, you've engaged business. At the moment, the biggest problem we've got is that um, governments are almost having to act as the consumer's conscience of the future. And it, it's a very hard role to play because you know, most governments in the world are elected on a relatively short-term electoral mandate. And to ask them to then make long-term, difficult decisions against that mandate, it, it's, it's almost mission impossible. Businesses uh, will be a lot more comfortable investing in this agenda when they see a strong consumer demand. And investors will back them in doing that. So actually, a, a bit of a realignment where following the last decade of increasing carbon consciousness, actually it does emerge that people really do care 
Uh, and I believe that is the position uh, when, when you look at people in, in, in the UK. I think the, the poll that was carried out was on a particular group of people who had another set of uh, priorities. And of course, you've got to look at what was being prioritized against what, for yeah. what end. Yes. Because if I had to define the policies that would get me elected, then I might not push that hard for climate change in those constituencies. Yeah. That wasn't the question. Do people care about climate change? Absolutely, they do. OK, thank, thank you. Well, I just want to add one point to that as well. If you take a very narrow, little Englander approach, as that poll kind of suggested, yeah. of, uh, of some of these prospective um, MPs, it's only UK PLC that's going to suffer the consequences of that. Because if you want GE to invest here, or you want Siemens to invest here, if that's the political landscape that they that's see true. coming, well, they're going to go to mainland Europe. They're not going to invest here. So I, I don't know in whose interest uh, that is, because that just threatens jobs, investment, you know, the whole potential of the UK to actually play a role in which, which is going to be the future, whether they like it or not. Okay, Miles, Miles do, you, do you agree with this or not, that we will actually lose jobs if we turn away from the low carbon economy? Do you, do you believe that? It's all about degree, and it's all about trying to get some degree of international level into this. But I would agree with what Tom said, that regardless of the sort of political agenda, and that will move... <coughs> And as we've said, it's perhaps moving one direction. But to be fair, I think a little bit of taking the steam out of the ideological bandwagon isn't a bad thing. I think now we've got a much more realistic approach. I do think Richard's right. There is a strong consumer franchise that some companies will export more than others. But most importantly, what it drives us back is the basic economics of improving our energy efficiency and really focusing on that. And others have said, and you've said it, business could do a lot more. And that's where I think, regardless of the overall political and maybe ideological agenda, that's where the focus makes, should makes be. E makes economic makes sense. sense yeah. Okay, D Damien Rees, before we come to the audience, just very briefly from you, as, as a newspaper man, um, you must see the change in trend in the newspapers. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph has long been climate skeptic editorially, but now the Express has gone sort of rampantly climate skeptic. It, it's sort of obvious to how, the, to, to how the Independent was a few years ago. And I watched The Independent, a tabloid newspaper, splashing stories as hard as possible. I watched it change The Guardian agenda. And I watched The Guardian agenda in turn trickle through to BBC, ITN, and back to the Daily Mail. And you know, the, just one newspaper can actually make a difference. Mail, is, Mail on Sunday is now becoming climate skeptic, and The Mail too. How do you see the newspaper landscape going, and how do you see that impacting on politics, which of course will in turn impact on business? I think it's really important to remember that scepticism is not the same as denial. I think it's really important that we do have a proper debate about it. I think the media has actually been rather too biased towards accepting a certain line. Uh, that's, not to, that's, not to mean, that's not to say it's not true, but I think what has been lacking is a bit more of an in-depth, balanced debate, and hopefully that's what you're seeing. I think there are dangers with newspapers like The Express that go too rabid. Uh, hopefully at the Telegraph... Well, the, we, the Express we, is we, now referring to it as the climate con. A, exactly, which I think is yeah. wrong. Right. But in terms of getting a message across, it's important, I think, that the media does now engage with their readers uh, a little bit more intelligently uh, now that the debate has moved on. And we have a proper debate, and scepticism has a part to play in that. Uh, one of the reasons why it's really important to have a proper debate is to make sure we don't waste money we cannot afford to waste resources on ideas that aren't necessarily true or true to the extent that some people say they are. And we're talking about huge investments in things like nuclear. Let's hope we need them, and I'm sure we do. But we need to have a proper debate before we start throwing around billions of pounds. I think, I think that's sensible. Uh, and when it comes to the politics, I don't think uh, it'll be a big issue when it comes to voting because climate change, low carbon economy is a long term problem. Politicians, as we know, are not very good at long term problems. They're good at short term problems, which is the budget deficit, which will be the main issue. But if I was a politician and I wanted to make it a big issue when it comes to votes, I'd probably try and change the spin a bit and change the labelling. I think global warming, low carbon economy turns people off. Personally, I go back to good old fashioned terms like pollution, waste. Those are the issues that we're really talking about, which no one talks about anymore. No one do, talks about does pollution. En does energy security, does that resonate as an issue? Do you think energy it's security? A, it's an incredibly important uh, issue. You're right, um, Roger. But uh, do people understand it? Maybe companies here may have had their gas cut off this winter. I don't know. I mean, that's certainly going to focus people's minds. Yeah. It's, a, it's a harder sell. 
I think pollution and waste are easier sells, and I think we ought to get back to those sort of basics to make it a political issue. Yeah, thank you very much. Now let me take as many questions from the audience as we possibly can. Um, starting, as we've had a bias to the front, let's have a bias to the back. Now I know there's Carbon Trust Stooges at the back, so we're not going to go to them. But there's a gentleman, there's a gentleman strategically placed between the front and the back. I think he's a good place to start. Please sir, say who you are and where you're from. Thank you. Uh, Paul Dickinson from Carbon Disclosure Project. My question really is about this uh, EU 20% or 30%. You know, the consumer and the biggest democracy in the world is how people spend their money every day. Are we doomed to be locked into a kind of lowest emissions reduction because our industry lacks the imagination uh, to pioneer low carbon solutions? Or can we use a 30% reduction target to uh, rapidly develop industries of the future that will give the EU economic advantage in the 21st century. Have we kind of got the will to win? Okay, thank you. I'm going to take a couple more if I can and see how they bundle together, whether they do at all. We'll go right to the back so long as you're not from the Carbon Trust. Oh, can, oh no, he's not. That's okay. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Uh, Graham Meeks from the, the Combined Heat and Power Association. Um, I, I represent businesses in an industry which has suffered uh, immensely from having a, a bold target put in front of it by, by the government and then the, uh, a blind faith in the EU emissions trading scheme to actually deliver some real investment against it. So I was uh, encouraged by the uh, scepticism on, 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 on the target front from, the, uh, from, the, from some of the panel. Um, but in its place, what we saw was then a discussion about variously regulation and uh, fiscal measures. Um, and if we wind, up, wind the clock back 10 years, uh, then the debate around emissions trading and the introduction of emissions trading was very much came in um, on a business agenda which was driving that forward because it was a preferable and arguably more economically efficient, so the argument went, uh, solution than uh, taxation. And we've now seemed to have gone full circle. Um, the question I've got for the panel is, is to what extent do they really believe that business would support a pro-regulation and pro-taxation agenda to get some clarity and some certainty into the uh, low-carbon economy? Okay, and let's just take one more. Anybody of the female persuasion tempted to um, stand up and say something? I know it's a largely male audience, but I will take a gender preference if anybody's <laughs> offering me one. <laughs> uh, no, another man. Sorry, sir, I, you, can't, you can't help your gender, I know. Please. No, ahead. I can't help my gender. Graham Hillier, I'm the strategy director at the Centre for Process Innovation. And um, in the UK, we emit about 10 tonnes of carbon dioxide each, which is three times the global average. And uh, Mr. Brown's target is that we reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 50% by 2020. I'm intrigued to know what the panel are going to do to halve their carbon dioxide emissions. <laughs> All right, They've got, they do have another 40 years in which to do it. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's, let's start with let's, let's start 2020. Oh, beg your pardon, I missed that one. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the, the 30%. Um, I, I think, Miles, let me come to you on this, because you know, this was something we touched on before when, when, when we were chatting. There is this vision held out by Lord Stern of the low-carbon economy, jobs and a, and, and a great transition, the, the new thing to, to take over. Uh, this clearly, at the moment, is, is not being driven. This vision will not be met under current circumstances. <laughs> Are we giving up a golden chance to boost the economy by our, by our nervousness around this agenda? Not at all. I mean, I think the target is just plucked out of the air. So I wouldn't say we're not making any progress towards an improved position. I just think that the government setting the target is the wrong way about it. When business senses the opportunity, and everyone has talked about it, it will drive for it. And what the government can do and the Carbon Trust and other agencies can do is help stimulate the new technologies, help stimulate the practices, the best practice, spread awareness of what can be done. And business will set aggressive targets if they see the business opportunity of it. What we don't need is government targets that distort the marketplace and that tend to lead governments to take the wrong actions that interfere with the business processes. What we need is the ability, the freedom. I agree with Damien about some clarity of regulation. But I, I would certainly, coming to the second question, would not meet many businessmen who would support greater regulation and taxation in order to get some kind of consistency because it would disadvantage us versus other countries. 
If they all did it, fine. Okay, well, while you're here, do you have faith in the EU, e EU ETS to deliver this low carbon agenda? Because it's not at the moment. No, no, we don't. don't. You don't? It needs to, it, it, but it's the right direction but we haven't found the right scheme to do it. See, it interests me because initially it was business, as gentlemen yeah, yeah, said, that pushed this agenda. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And it was the United States that demanded this from yeah. Kyoto yeah, uh, on the under the condition on which they would sign. And then they pulled out and left Europe with the emissions trading system. Yeah, no, I mean, you've, lost faith, you've lost faith in it? Would you scrap well, it? Well, not lost faith in the, the principle of it. It must be the right direction. What seems to be, we just can't seem to deliver it. And I, I mean, others much closer to it maybe understand better why it doesn't work better. But why they, don't, why they can't deliver it is because it depends on a cap. It's a cap and trade. And the cap is set too high because organizations yeah. like yours lobby against yeah. their member governments to get the tap higher. <laughs> yes. That's fair. But isn't it something to do with that? <laughs> Hello. Can, can we rerun that one on for the cameras? <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. But it hasn't the, uh, the trading system been undermined by the issuance of, yeah. of credits? Yeah. And that's the government's. If the government's in the, actually interfere in the markets, then the market would probably well, set because, a proper rate. That's because of lobbying by his members. It is, this is, this is, we had this power that it was supposed well, to well, well, We had the power to set targets, which yeah. is what you yeah. said we did. Yeah. No, seriously, this is, you hit, really hit on something here, because this is genuinely yeah, a circular problem. It is, yeah. You know, you, you, there, is, there is an extent of regulatory capture in every country. Of course there is. Governments want to benefit their own businesses. And if there's an issue of burden sharing, like there is in the EU ETS, every government wants to help its own business and opens the lobbying door to that business. Those businesses then complain that the targets aren't clear enough or the incentives aren't there for them to improve their performance precisely because they've lobbied against them. It is actually a serious problem and needs someone to think about it. Yeah. Anybody volunteering? Tom, you look like... like <laughs> I think you can push your targets as far as you can. Um, the reality is what, what is what are businesses going to need to do to meet those targets? Um, the reality is that energy efficiency uh, and a number of new low carbon technologies have something in common. You invest up front for savings over a number of years. And in the corporate rat race to deliver quarterly, half yearly results uh, that are never uh, going downwards but always improving, it's very hard to make that long term investment uh, unless you've got the finance available. So actually, I think you know, if we could find a way of financing the transition to a low carbon economy and allowing businesses to invest up front in energy efficiency and indeed in, in big low carbon technologies to knock the hell out of the cost structure and bring them down, you get to 30%, everybody's a winner because Europe is distinctively advantaged having made that investment. If on the other hand, you want European businesses to uh, go out into the markets and, and, and be unable essentially to raise the funding in any other way, then they will simply contract rather than be able to meet the target. So I think but this, I mean, this the is ability a, This is a much bigger structural problem. You can't get funding for a new awning for a news agent. Absolutely. So, so I think the funding problem is one that we absolutely need to see in the context of building a low carbon economy. Now, in a very small way, I'm so glad... So we have to change the banking system before no, we sort no, out the carbon problem. Hang on. The, the reality is that, you know, interest-free loans. Um, halfway through last year, when the economic downturn suddenly kicked in, um, we saw demand for loans dry up because people went, oh, I'm not going to do anything at all. Then we saw a number of businesses, a lot of businesses, saying, actually, we are going to be here for the long term, so we better get ourselves positioned and be as efficient as we can. We made a few small tweaks to the terms under which we could give loans, and suddenly we were seeing record loans going out of the Carbon Trust to SMEs, allowing them to invest in energy efficiency. And it was great. And we're doing more of it this year, and that's great. But there is a million, you know, it's a long way, our support for SMEs in this country at the level we're currently doing it, from supporting the mass transition and investment in low carbon economy and infrastructure that's required to meet a 30% target. I'm all in favour of the 30% target, so long as we can ensure that it's done on business terms. OK. Let me take another couple of questions. I will, won't ignore that personal question. I'll come to it. I want to come to it at the end. So, gentleman here. And I'm still looking for someone with a different chromosome balance, if they're volunteering. Can't, can't make that one, I'm afraid. Uh, Tim Lunell from the National Energy Foundation. Uh, I just wonder whether um, the sort of short-term economics is really masking the underlying trends to such an extent that we're really not seeing that there might be some real tipping points underneath, particularly with consumers, particularly with employees. Uh, Richard Reed and Wayne, which you talked about, the employees themselves and also your customers. I think, you know, I'm willing to, to bet that Innocent will be here in 2020, whereas there are some organisations, maybe in this room, that aren't seeing the tipping points that are underneath this short-term surface that won't be here 
in 2020. And I just wonder whether, as a panel, we can be th you know, move a little bit further forward and thinking about some of the, the trends and momentum beneath. Because when, you know, as organizations now, when we're out there, 18 months ago when we were talking to employees of major financial institutions like HPLOS and others, the employees there saw that responding to climate change was key for them as employees, for their, for their major customers. And that's still there. It's just hidden by a short-term trend. And I believe there's just too much focus on that short-term trend and we're missing some of the, the longer-term uh, uh, sort of tipping points. Okay, uh, okay thank you. Let, let, let me stop you there, because I think we'd better make that the last question, then I'll come to the personal stuff. Uh, Richard. Oh, in that case, <laughs> ma madam. <laughs> Hi, Kelly Webber from Green Gold. Um, very quick question. With the um, political will uh, seeping away from governments and the EU being semi uh, um, comatose in, in uh, Copenhagen. Where is the long-term price signal that's going to come for carbon? You know, how are you going to price the externalities to uh, give you the investment signals to help the transformational moves that you're talking about for a low-carbon economy? Okay, thank you. Um, Richard Reid from Innocent, would you pick up both those points, tipping points from individuals and long-term carbon price signal? Well, I, I'm a big optimist in the sort of the... the about the power of the consumer. There's, you can pass as much legislation as you like in a business if it doesn't agree with it, it will do everything it can to avoid it. But if a consumer stops buying that business's products, that business will turn on the sixpence to, to win those customers back. So I think fundamentally through education about the issues and based on facts, not feelings, and actually the truth rather than the sound bites, I think if we can get that to consumers, then that gives us an opportunity uh, to sort of turn this situation around. Uh, the, the thing about targets, I, from what I understand, and I could be wrong here, they're not picked out of thin air. They're based on the science of there's a finite amount of carbon dioxide that the atmosphere can contain. There's so much in it at currently, and therefore we've got a finite amount left. And so we have to base the targets on that. And even though it's impossible to reach them, that doesn't mean that the science is wrong. So I really advocate every individual, every business, every politician analyzing the facts of where they are. I saw in our business, I thought I knew where the carbon was in our business system, and then we did a carbon audit, and it was absolutely enlightening to see where the carbon came from. And just having that fact, rather than my prejudice, allowed us to go from a smoothie having 280 grams of carbon in the bottle to 207 grams. So we've got sort of the first third out. So to answer the question about how do we take it out, how do we get to 50%, I can, I, can, I, can I ask you, sorry, did that cost money or did that make money, that process? No, I think it's like with anything. The first third is always going to be relatively easy, relatively cheap. I think the second third is going to be incredibly difficult, and I think the, third, the final third is virtually impossible. I'm at the stage now, so actually, by and large, outside of the, the, the staffing cost, having people work on the projects, I think it saves us money. Really simple things. We went from our pallets being packed eight boxes high to now they're packed ten boxes high. That saved us 50,000 tons of carbon and quite a lot of money too. We introduced a recycled plastic bottle. That did cost money, but I think we've probably about broken even as a business because some consumers care about our bottle being made out of recycled plastic. So I see that as that's encouraging, but I also know the second third is really difficult because that's about what lorries are powered by and how electricity is generated. And that requires a huge mobilization of the sort of the infrastructure of this country that outside of World War II has no precedent in terms of what we've actually got to do. Okay, thank but you. Can thank I just make my yeah. final pitch? Because sure. I understand that I sound like a bit of a sort of raving lunatic about these things, but one of the, what I advocate about the big targets is it creates a sense of urgency. And I think there is a real benefit from a sense of urgency, which means we might go first, because what I don't want to be is last in line as a country when we decide that we do want nuclear power or whatever we think the solution is, because there's only so many people that know how to build them, and there's only so many people that put money into them. And if that is the right answer, I want to be at the front of the queue, not right at the end, squabbling over for much higher prices and being the sort of the last in line to yeah, get we, it. Yeah, we're actually already quite a long way back. Um, <laughs> somewhere outside the door. David Croft uh, from Cadbury, uh, would you uh, like... Uh, 
well, craft, should I say, whichever, wherever, where, 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 wherever it is you're from, what's your view about, about what's needed in terms of uh, getting the price signals and whether you see that there will be tipping points by, by the 2020? Are we, looking, are we looking too near term at the moment? I, I, think consumers, um, I think consumers are very savvy about this. I think they recognise um, the that climate change is starting to happen. There might be a degree of scepticism. There might be a, a need for more informed debate about it to help, to help shape the agenda going forward. But I think consumers um, are, by and large, already looking for lower carbon solutions. So what would, and, what would bring about that carbon price signal that the, the questioner was talking about? Well, I, I think that then comes down to sort of critical mass uh, of people supporting it. And, and I think that's where, you know, reaction to consumer um, movement is, is perhaps slower to start than, than you might expect in a very consumer-driven economy like the UK. Uh, and I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, having looked at what our consumers are saying to us and what our just as importantly, what our customers are saying to us in terms of retailers and saying, you know, you need to think about where your product range, your product services, uh, your overall business offering is heading because there's a low carbon expectation from them. Then it's, it's as you create that critical mass, then that's when I think we'll start to see um, a better perspective on what carbon pricing really should look like. Because at the moment, I think for the bulk of people, it, it's a sort of somewhat meaningless um, position and the awareness isn't really there about it. But that, for me, that awareness is, is absolutely growing. I mean, consumers, if I, if I look at the research that we've got, consumers are asking increasingly, you know, what is the, what is the focus of our product development? Um, if, if the feedback from our employee service is anything to go by, this is very high on their agenda. And whilst in, in, you know, in the immediate short term, we may not be seeing um, you know, the strength of support um, that might tip more businesses into this type of agenda. I think over the last two or three years, we've seen a very um, obvious and increasing trend that as we move towards 2015 can only increase further. And you know, I look at um, the sort of demand that we had, uh, as Richard was saying, about some of the packaging. You know, we, the, the demand for uh, things like Easter eggs with less packaging from a Cadbury point of view was huge. Um, retailers were coming to us the following year saying, please give us more of this because this is what our consumers are demanding. This is not just a gimmick. This is not just a PR exercise. This is because there's a consumer movement afoot that is driving towards that sort of products. Those products are relatively few and far between, though. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the question of tipping point comes when more, cons uh, more businesses start to see the advantages, both in terms of how they run their business in terms of business efficiency, energy efficiency, and so on and so forth. And secondly, how they adapt to the marketplace and the products that they offer for the future. Uh, and and that's, that's the sort of step change we're looking for. Now, will that be driven by targets? I don't think so. I think it will be driven by businesses appreciating business advantages out of that. Okay, so we need to make all products like the Easter egg. So let's just, yes. finish, let's just finish with a very quick run round through, through the panel, starting with you, Damien. Uh, what are, if, if there are any, what are your personal and business carbon targets for 2020? Do you have any? Not personally, no, other than to... Uh do the most I possibly can, because obviously I've already uh, um, communicated a fairly sceptical view of targets, so uh, I obviously don't set them for myself. But uh, the, and, and the, the, te the, the, te the Telegraph Group? <laughs> We've just moved to a new flashy new building, actually, uh, and uh, we are ab about to uh, embark on and construct a very ambitious uh, new uh, approach to being greener and better. Uh, that we're currently discussing internally. OK, thank you. That's suitably vague. Um, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, just to begin with, one fact. I think 44% of our CO2 emissions come from the building sector. So, I mean, when people think about how complex this problem is to solve, actually, we could solve half the, building, half the problem just sorting out our, our buildings. And I know that's expensive, but if you think about the investment in our, in our buildings, because most of them built today will be around in 2050, over the next 40 years, it's not technically that difficult um, to solve um, half the problem. I mean, it's not technically that difficult to solve the other half of the problem in terms of where our energy comes from either. So I think that buildings, to a certain extent, are key. So, I mean, personally, what I've done, I have solar PV on the roof of our house. Um, I've just taken out um, a loan to carry out uh, an investment program uh, for uh, double glazing and so on in my house. I have an electric car. 
I don't fly for personal reasons. I do exceptionally for um, uh, business reasons. And we have a similar program at work in terms of the refurbishment of the building, and, and we do have targets year on year in terms of uh, uh, cutting CO2 emissions because I think that targets are really important. I don't know why you're so object to them so much. In, in the sense, it's a bit like just having a map. You know, if you want to get from yeah, London to yeah. Edinburgh, you've got to know how to get there. So, I mean, that's basically all the, all the target is giving you. It's just giving you a sense no, of direction. It's not telling you how to get there. Okay. Well, it's a sense of direction. Okay, Miles, personal and business targets by 2020? Personal, I've just bought a solar panel heated house with geothermal heating, so I'm doing my bit. Um, but well, when are you having us around for drinks? Yeah, all right, you'll be welcome. Um, but I do think our task is to really get every business. Um, and I, I don't agree with the questioner that business is losing sight of this for short-term problems, because I don't think they are. I think they're absolutely seeing the role of energy saving, greater efficiency alongside their low-carbon objectives. And I do think, uh, as others have said, that there is a strong consumer drive for it, but it's got to be in an economic way, not in an artificial way. Okay. David. Personal and business. Well, you said your business, 50% were by... Well, I, is it? B business, 50% by 2020. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's an imperative um, in some countries already. And I mean, personal? Personal. Cutting down the meat, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> that um, wasn't meant to be a deeply personal remark. I do, I do apologise <laughs> if it appeared that way. Uh, you know, at a, at a personal level, you know, I've had the hybrid car for the last three years. I've had... It has the same performance as anything else, so why would you do anything else? Um, I, I, you know, the, the wood burner heats the house. Um, I haven't got the solar cells yet. The insulation just got doubled in the loft. All of those sorts of things happen. I think for me the key thing is um, actually things like better public transport that makes it easy to use public transport and that makes it easy to switch. Okay, thank you. Richard? So we have a, an amber target which is a 5% reduction per year and green which is our stretch target is 7% reduction per year for the footprint of the business. Uh, so that's interesting. I'll just no make note of that because they said a double target. This is what you're talking about. Your, well, am your amber is what you absolutely have to achieve. Yeah, less, is what less than five for. is what we, we, we do everything to get to traffic lights. And so we have a, one for revenue, one for profit, one for gross margin, one for carbon. We always have an amber, which is the one that we're saying is the sort of is OK. And yep. then green is good. So yeah. less than... It's not a very good road safety message. <laughs> <laughs> Go faster. I'll basically. stay away from you on the road. Yeah. But then on, on a personal level? Well, personally, I found out a fact on Friday which has just blown my mind, which is that if the UK uh, didn't eat meat three days a week, then it would save the same amount of energy that uh, it would take 10 nuclear power stations to provide. So my pitch is save the world, eat vegetables. Okay. I'm delighted everybody's looking at their carbon footprint as being not just what they do at home and in their personal lives, but what they do in terms of public amenity, public transport and, and work or school or whatever. And the figure of 11 tonnes of CO2 per person is, is the whole thing, unlike the sort of three or four tonnes that you get if you run a carbon calculator on what you do. So, you know, at home I do the obvious things of lots and lots of double glazing and I drive a Fiat Panda diesel, uh, which is pretty efficient. Um, but I think at work, you know, we can do some really major things. And, and we've started a program of, of trying to reduce our carbon footprint in what is already a, a pretty decent building uh, by turning down the temperature in winter. And we're going to let it go pretty high in summer uh, to really increase that spread. So at the moment, my bag has a tank top. And most people will see me going around the office in a tank top because it's bloody freezing. <laughs> and we are at the moment running at around about 19, 20 degrees. And it's, it's marginal. But if you wear a, a light sweater, it's fine. How does it go with your recruitment strategy? Um, <laughs> we haven't had that problem as yet. <laughs> now, what, the other question, of course, is what happens in summer? Because if we're going to run in summer at maybe 23, 24 degrees, yeah. um, you know, we're going to have to get rid of ties. We're going to have to accept that you know, we need to be comfortable on those hot summer so days. Shorts. And are you, have, are you buying less stuff with all that embodied carbon? Because that's something that I think often, yeah. we, in a consumer economy, we all buy lots of stuff, and we don't realise yeah. yeah. what's coming I mean, in. I mean, like Richard, there are just a few things, a few checkpoints, yeah, which I know yeah. um, are kind of relevant to me in, in my personal habits. And things like you know, meat we all, we all know about, and certainly I, I now eat less meat for a whole number of reasons, including uh, the environmental impact. Um, I wasn't aware, for instance, that rice is significantly worse in terms of environmental impact than pasta uh, because of methane emissions from paddy fields. So think, uh, think twice when you have noodles instead of rice with a stir-fry. 
I mean, there, and there are a whole number of things, and there are only about 10 things I really understand, but those 10 things can actually translate into half the shopping basket. Okay, thank you very much. Now, we're going to have to wind up. Um, it's been a really good session, and I'd have, be happy for it to go on, but people need to get, to get their trains, at least some do. Uh, you are very welcome to stay on. There are drinks downstairs, and if you've got more questions to the Carbon Trust or you want to beat them up everything, they're there volunteering. But for now, thank you for attending, and let's give a big thanks to the excellent panel. <laughs>